and in this episode of Review, who are you gonna call? That's right, the Ghostbusters. Today we're talking about the Ghostbusters, the 1984 comedy film starring Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Hal Ramis, and Ernie Hudson. Rich. What? You're a YouTuber, but you're not an asshole YouTuber. Oh, fuck. I got confused. Yeah. I saw a red curtain. I thought we were that one prick. What's his name? Uh, there's so many pricks I, out I, there. I can't remember his fucking name. Well, Rich, we're here today to talk about the 1984 flop film Ghostbusters. Oh, wait, wait. I think it's thinking about Ghostbusters 2016, the flop film Ghostbusters. Oh, my goodness. We're already into it. Why, why not? Well, I suppose we should talk about uh, the elephant in the room before we discuss Ghostbusters. I was talking about Melissa McCarthy because she's fat. <laughs> See, there's too many easy jokes we could make. No, seriously, Rich. Yeah. Uh, if we're gonna talk about the new Ghostbusters film, I brought along a barf bag for you. <laughs> In case you suddenly feel the urge to throw up. Oh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Are we being fair? Well, Are we being fair to Ghostbusters 2016? Here's the thing. At this point, we have not seen the new Ghostbusters film. We're doing our review episode on I would say probably both of our, one of our favorite films of all time, yeah, it's fair yeah. to say that. Uh, Ghostbusters, a film that has molded our lives. Uh, because look where we are now. For many, many years, the rumors were swirling of a Ghostbusters 3. And we, we speculated many times on what this would be. And then... We, we talked about how horrible it was going to be. We talked about, yes, and, and that's kind of one of the things I want to discuss where... Yeah, the, the, here's the problem with remaking Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters isn't just a, a science fiction film about people who capture ghosts with laser beams. It's very specifically three great performances by three great comedians and also Ernie Hudson. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you can't, you can't just recreate that chemistry. No, it's a, it's a happy accident of you, a film because there, there are three or four uh, or maybe even five brilliant minds at work who I think all had kind of a different idea of how the film would turn out. Especially Dan Aykroyd. Uh, mainly speaking about <laughs> Dan Aykroyd. Uh, and I have a feeling that uh, Bill Murray had no idea what was going on and he's just being sarcastic. You can tell by certain interviews that he does. He's just like, I don't know, whatever. We're not here just to get a couple of yucks. <laughs> no, that's not what we're about. And we're not here to just to stay off the streets. We're here to do something very, very important. And so you have all these different, different wonderful talents that, that have no idea what kind of movie they're making. The only one who really did, I think, was Ivan Reitman. <laughs> um, maybe Harold Ramis. But uh, it, it's this wonderful, wonderful blend of, of comedy and science. Because Dan Aykroyd really takes his stuff seriously. Yes. And, and you're right. It's, it's about the performances. And had I seen Ghostbusters 2016 trailer, with who, I don't know, who did we joke that we, Seth, Seth, Seth Rogen were joking about being in it at some point, like Jack Black, years ago, 10 years ago, was Jack Michael, Black. Michael Cera, um, you know, whoever, whoever current comedians are. God forbid James Franco. It could have very easily been a Judd Apatow movie. Mm -hmm. Who knows? And if it had just as much goofy nonsense that's in this Ghostbusters 2016, I still would have had the same reaction. Actually, to me, having an all-female cast is one of the biggest attributes to the movie because you're not, women, will, women comedians will have a different perspective, a different way of doing the performances than like, you can't replace Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Harold Ramis, mm -hmm. you just can't. So having male counterparts replace them or try to be as funny as them, I think would have been more disastrous. Well, about, about the only thing you could do is a gimmick. It's, it's girls, it's a gimmick. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I, I think they were doing that to kind of uh, uh, curtail some of the criticism that yeah. would have come if you put a Seth Rogen in there. I don't have anything against Seth Rogen. I'm just saying those actors in Ghostbusters were very specific, like you said, and it was perfect. 
My parents left me that house. I was born there. You're not going to lose the house. Everybody has three mortgages nowadays. But at 19%, you didn't even bargain with the guy. Ray, for your information, the interest rate alone for the first five years comes to $95,000. Well, I think I think we, we speculated that there would be a flying Ghostbusters car in I, Ghostbusters 3. I speculated point. because you have the top, you have the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, and then you have, like, the, the, the Statue of Liberty. I, I speculated that they were going to have to turn like the Empire State Building into a giant ghost trap. Like, like Dan Aykroyd was going to have some dialogue. The architects of this building were really the earliest Ghostbusters, and this was designed to stop a ghost invasion in Manhattan. And like, the the the, the Empire State Building was going to suck in some kind of giant ghost that was like larger than the city. Yes, and there could have been a completely different way that the new Ghostbusters reboot went. Which is, I, I, was, I was watching Ghostbusters as well. I did do some research. Yeah. This, although I was watching it with all the little uh, behind the scenes documentary stuff. And I was thinking like proton packs are, are, are an equivalent to the lightsaber, where they're awesome. <laughs> but only, they're only awesome with, when used sparingly. And, and according to the story, because they don't really fire their proton packs that much in the, ghost, the first Ghostbusters movie. Am I right? Yeah. So we very well, well could have had a big, dumb, stupid, kind of Michael Bay-esque movie where people are firing proton packs all over the place and it got big and epic, you know? Yeah. And dumb. Uh, that very well could have happened. It seems that Paul Feig, Paul Feig, uh, they seem to have gone to the comedy route because Paul Feig did Bridesmaids mm -hmm. um, and uh, other films. Uh, he did lots of episodes of The Office, and he's a comedy guy. Uh, the, the only real problem with Ghostbusters 2016 is that the comedy looks very lowbrow. That stuff went everywhere, by the way, in every crack. Very hard to wash off. Ow, that's going to leave a mark. The power of pain compels you. When, of course, in the original Ghostbusters, it's, it's the best comedy ever captured in a motion picture, which is dry and sarcastic, which is why the film is a work of art. I think he once described Ghostbusters as a vehicle for Bill Murray to say witty things. Oh, that's all it is. It's, yeah, that's yeah. That's all it is. The, go, the story and the ghosts and the, uh, everything's a backdrop. And it's, it's, it's also a vehicle for um, uh, Dan Aykroyd's crazy. They had to tone that crazy down so much. They had they had some behind the scenes stuff where they're like like asking all the main guys, you know, what what did, did you show your kids Ghostbusters? And Ivan Reitman's like, oh, I showed my kids. You know, they think think it's fun. They said, Daddy, you made a great movie. And then uh, Dan Aykroyd's like, of course I showed my kids. And they asked me if ghosts in the movie are real, and I had to tell them the truth that yes, <laughs> it's all real. <laughs> They've asked me, you know, do I believe in ghosts and are ghosts real? And I, I can't lie to them and I have to tell them that I do believe and I do believe they're real. I guess what's funny is their wide-eyed response. They're expecting me to say, well, no, it's just a movie, but I'm not going to say that to them because I respect their intelligence and their perception as, as little beings and, uh, you know. Uh, but but uh, that's his, that's his... Uh, it's his passion. It's his passion. It's like almost his religion. And uh, you know what? It's but fine. It's fine. He he really believes in all. And you know what? As you, you know, I'm, I am a, a nut for paranormal. All things paranormal. Uh, I can't say whether or not I believe in ghosts 100 percent, but I find all that stuff fascinating. Uh, different dimensions, you know, uh, string theory, g paranormal ghosts. Time echoes. Uh, uh, the the Mandela effect. Have you heard about this? I've, I've heard about that. Yeah, people that's... misremember things and then they think reality has changed around them rather than they just forgot something. Oh right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I find all that stuff interesting. So it's 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 great that that Dan Aykroyd has uh, brought that angle to the to the Ghostbusters, where he believes that proton packs are real <laughs> and that you really can catch ghosts uh, because it adds that element that perfect element of believability, you know, and the movie starts off very, very believable. And it kind of turns into, into wonderful chaos it, at the it, end. It builds up to the point where you can believe a giant marshmallow man is walking down the streets. Well, there's something you don't see every day. And a dimensional rift has opened with the super god named Gozer. <laughs> 
from from a couple of uh, guys in a in a laboratory to that. You, you go from the, the the simple books floating across in the library mm -hmm. to the city's blowing up mm -hmm. and marshmallow fluff is raining down from the skies. Yes, yes. Close, lock the system, set your entry grid, neutronize your field, and the light is green, the crap is clean. Uh, the Ghostbusters are anti-horror. In, in other movies with like a supernatural element, you combat the supernatural with the supernatural. Like once, you know, the evil dead start appearing, you have to read from the Necronomicon and have the exact phrasing or you, you need to find the mystic dagger to stop the ghost and perform the ritual. The Ghostbusters take that and turn it on its head. It's like, we're gonna use our own damn science mm -hmm. to fight these things. And I, 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 that, that makes the, the concept interesting to me. They, they don't fight on the, the monster's terms. And in a way, they're, they're little superheroes. They have this amazing technology that no one, no one else has. And it's a joke, like the whole movie's... Uh, see, that's where, I, that's where I have this feeling, like it, it was kind of a happy accident, because I think the gag was that their, their schlubby, uh, blue-collar exterminators that exterminate ghosts. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is kind of like, like a comedy concept. And that's why... You know, uh, Bill Murray's always like making all these jokes the whole time, and it's essentially a comedy, but it has that that underpinning, that underlayer of of the real, the reality to it. And that's why I always like the fact that the threat, and I've never really liked Slimer. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always liked everything else in the movie. The fact that the threat is actually like this real dangerous inter interdimensional threat. <laughs> And well, the tone is, yeah, the tone is great because they are the only thing that, that's really silly in the movie. The Ghostbusters? The Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. 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 Everyone else plays it uh, as played straight. Um, Except for maybe Rick Moranis, but... Uh, well, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he's... But the, the threat is real. Choose the form of the destructor. There's that element of... It's a, it's a mixture, too, between ghosts as we know them, which are dead people, and some kind of bizarre supernatural occurrence. Because really, they are not fighting a ghost yeah. at the end of Ghostbusters. They're trying to seal an interdimensional portal. Well, it's kind of it's kind of Lovecraftian, sure. like C Cthulhu, uh, the the other dimensional gods mm -hmm. who will come someday to destroy us all. Yeah, well, I mean, the first ghost they see though is the ghost of presumably a dead librarian yeah. from the 1800s, and then they kind of like the only I, I, the only other human ghost I can recall in the Ghostbusters series is the Central Park jogger. Yeah, yeah. And other than that, they're all like little monsters. Could could Slimer have been a human? The ghost have to look human. What the ghost of George Lucas? <laughs> oh wait, sorry. The the uh, the the so and so brothers who died in the electric chair, who become big fat cartoon ghosts for no reason at all. Well, it's also the scariest ghost in Ghostbusters, the cab driver. The zombie cab driver. It, but he wasn't really a ghost as much as he was a zombie. It was just a skeleton. It was an undead skeleton. It wasn't but, glowing or transparent. But the ghost came into the tailpipe of the cab. And, and then, then I think that turned into the... Dan, we need to Skype Dan Aykroyd right away. <laughs> I, that's the thing. It's like, it's like all the rules are out the window. It's not like we're, you know, we're going to hunt this or that. Who cares? It should be called Paranormal Busters. It's, it's a misleading title. But the, the logo is, is perfect. It's a ghost, uh, which is fantastical and paranormal and, and, and m mythical, mixed with a very mundane symbol of no smoking. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because that, that in the 80s, that, those, those were popping everywhere, everywhere the, the no smoking mm -hmm. logo. Yeah, don't do this, you know, no crossing the street. The, the, the no sign, I think it has an official name, but I can't recall yeah. it right now, but that that's the Ghostbusters, and then the ghost is the ghosts, and it's perfect. It's perfect. No ghost. No ghosts. That's all you need. And for some reason, I don't know, seeing that logo on the new movie just makes me want to throw up. It's not as bad as the Ghostbusters 2 logo, where he's just doing the peace thing. But I think we're going to refrain from talking about yeah? Ghostbusters 2, yeah. 
I did see the Ghostbusters 2 logo in person uh, because uh, I, I'll bring up this wonderful, wonderful moment in my life. Uh, Jay and I went on a, a video production shoot to New York City many years ago, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifteen years ago, I'm not even sure. And it was in Central Park, it was uh, in Central Park West. And, and we're, we walked around because we had set up our gear and we're, we had a couple hours before the shoot started. And, the, and then we were like, isn't that the, the building from Ghostbusters? Isn't that Louis Tully's apartment building? And sure enough, it was. In fact, we made a video about it, but we saw Louis Tully's apartment building, and literally across the street in Central Park is, or was, the restaurant called Tavern on the Green, which is where he pounds on the glass. And we, and we, we started finding all these locations. And then we said, we're gonna, we gotta go to the, the location. And you know what I'm talking about. The, the firehouse. The library, oh. Oh, we did go to the New York Public Library too, but uh, we, we took a cab to the Ghostbusters firehouse. Uh, and then there it was, and, and you know, every, every five minutes or every minute, there was, you know, people coming up, taking pictures. Yeah. It was like a constant stream. Very, very mild, but constant. Uh, the, then, then when we were there, they opened up the door, the firehouse door, and they have inside there on the wall, they have the sign from Ghostbusters 2 on the wall. Do they do anything there or is it just a tourist it's attraction? It's still a working still a firehouse, yeah. Huh. The, the, uh, I think we talked about this in our Ghostbusters 2 commentary, uh, which is available on Bandcamp. But the exteriors were shot in New York and then the interiors were shot in a firehouse in, in uh, LA. Yeah. So yeah, when it opens up, it doesn't look like the inside of it. They, they did build a recreation of the exterior of the hotel for when the street gets all oh, fucked yes. up. Oh yes, that, that is also amazing. Is That's that, impressive. It's impressive, uh, it's f f seamless. I never had any idea that was a set. Yeah, yeah well I had to crush up the street, but yeah, they built the exterior of that. I can't believe someone didn't just say, man, we don't need the street to break up. Maybe they just walk inside. I can't believe like a bean counter didn't say that. Why do we have to build this multi-billion dollar set? Because it was the 80s, man, and they knew how to make movies back then. Now it would be a, a computer graphic effect that looks terrible. Yeah. Oh, I got something special for you. You like that? You got more where that came from. Well, thank God for cocaine. That's right, Rich. Smoke, yeah, we gotta, yeah, set's gonna blow up. It's gonna be, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't know. Why does he sound like the guy that runs the cartoon factory in The Simpsons? And Harold Ramis, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to be, bring up. It's very sad. I mean, it really takes the punch out of this new movie, but it also confirms the fact that I, I'm okay with them not making one with the original cast. I mean, you have to be at this point, obviously, because yeah. Harold Ramis has died, but I always thought a third Ghostbusters movie with the original cast would have still been wonderful. And they're all like, we're too old, or, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite lines from the second one is sucking the guts boys were the Ghostbusters. Uh, it's because uh, Harold Ramis was, was very overweight in the end of his life. Um, and, uh, you know, Bill Murray looks like the Crypt Keeper from uh, Tales from the Crypt, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and they all look terrible, except for Ernie Hudson, who somehow looks exactly the same as he did in 1984. As they say, black don't crack. Um, but, uh, I would have loved to see all of them looking horribly old and fat and schlubby trying to be Ghostbusters again. And all the humor you can mine from that. Yeah. Ghostbusters only needs a third film to redeem itself from the second. Or you just forget about the second. What ha would happen, have happened, Rich, if we said, oh my God, that Temple of Doom movie, uh, we're done. We wouldn't have uh, Last Crusade. Because they said that, oh my God, this, this. I actually this, like Temple of Doom though. I, that's one of my favorites, but it's the least. Why are we having this argument? Because it's the least, it's the least popular amongst all of them because it was so dark and horrible and racist and miserable. 
Look, in, in Ghostbusters 2, Bill Murray wanted to be doing something else. Mm -hmm. and, and the novelty of, of the ghost catching idea was, was done. Like, like, like part of Ghostbusters is that that idea is so novel, like catching ghosts with, with science and the, the traps and the equipment. That was all, that was, oh, that's neat. And then Ghostbusters 2 came out, what was it, like five, five years later? It was, it was too long to be fresh. Like maybe if Ghostbusters 2 came out like two years later, it would have been different. But five years later, it wasn't a fresh, yeah, I, I know. And, and, and that's, why, that's why in that movie, like the first half, when it's just those characters and their chemistry and they're in different situations, why that first half of that movie is so interesting. And the minute they get their proton packs back, everything just feels routine. Mm. It's like, oh, we're, they're the ghosts, they're, they're gonna shoot ghosts, yeah, I know. It became less special. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, made so many missteps where they could have made a third one in like the mid 90s that kind of uh, uh, fixed everything. But who knows, okay. who knows? Redeemed it it's, a little. It's too late. It's too late now. Um, and Annie Potts, she was right all along when she said, I'm usually very psychic about these things. I believe you're gonna die. Oh. I'm not making a joke. Well, of course she was right. We're all gonna die. Mike, I'm, I'm very psychic about these things. I think you're gonna die. It gives me the willies now when she says that line on, on the TV screen, Rich. And you know, I'm not making a joke. I, I, Harold Ramis was, was wonderful. And it's like, you know, it's like losing one of, when John Lennon got shot. You know, there could never be a Beatles reunion then. Has the Ghostbusters formula worked outside of Ghostbusters? That's a very good question. The answer is no. I'm trying to think of some of them. What was the, what was the one with uh, David Duchovny? I think it was also Ivan Reitman. Wasn't that Evolution or something like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, geez, that was, movie. Wasn't wow. that basically made to be another ghost? It's like Ghostbusters, but yeah. I wha think, wacky supernatural. I think the, the, I think the big key is restraint. It's having that restraint uh, to hold back until the very ending of the film, which is what Ghostbusters did. It, 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 it's a perfect movie. Perfectly set up, perfectly acted, executed everything. Like, like, like Gremlins? Like Gremlins, yeah. Which came out the same year. It was the same, same week, I think. Really? Oh my I, I could God. be wrong. What a magical year that was, that was 1984. Amazing. Yes, it was. Don't piss off the ghost. Really? It's no different to me than the Robocop or Total Recall remakes. You're taking a film that even though it's 30 years old, still works exceedingly well. And, and you're trying to recreate something you can't recreate with, with that chemistry that those actors had. Maybe they're not trying to recreate it. Maybe they have the licensing for the name and are slapping a film together to make a whole bunch of money real fast. Have you considered that option? But Mike, they're women. So feminism. Okay, I don't know if it was a race thing or a lady thing, but I'm mad as hell. And it's good. Because they're women. Mm -hmm. Women can do anything a man can do, especially a fictional job catching Th ghosts. This can't be a cynical cash grab because they're female. Oh, right. You're right. That invalidates your argument. We'll cross the streams. Excuse me, Egon. You said crossing the streams was bad. Cross the streams. You're going to endanger us. You're going to endanger our client, the nice lady who paid us in advance before she became a dog. It's don't cross the streams, the just kind of the lamest setup for the ending they could have done. Just one line earlier in the film, oh yeah, we shouldn't cross the streams. Then at the end of the film, we need to cross the streams. Well, he, well Egon, Egon explained the, the particle physics involvement <laughs> of it. All it was was, yes, yes, on a surface level, yes. Uh, story component wise, this is a big dangerous thing we should do. Yeah. Let's do it together as a team. We're gonna take the risk together, we're, you know. Yeah, I always felt fairly weak to me. It is, it is the weakest part of the movie. And I've always hated the line, she's a dog. Okay, so, she's a dog. I've always thought that that ruined the emotional intensity of watching Scorny Weaver transform into a monster. 
<laughs> well, Bill Murray has been been uh, fawning after the whole film, and he it's like, hey, how about I say this? I just picture Bill Murray on the set, like, I'm gonna say this, and she's a dog, ha <laughs> and, and it's like, oh no, that's the only line in the whole film that I don't like. I don't know. That whole romance always struck me as creepy because. I never got the feeling that Peter Venkman wanted to do anything other than just sleep with her and move on. But he had his chance when she was possessed. She said, I want you inside me. And he's like, he goes, God, do it. No, it's his subconscious talked. And, yeah. then, and then he's like, eh, it seems like there's already a couple people you're, in there. Already. <laughs> you're, you're, you're talking about when, when, when he showed up to go on the date with her? Yes. Yeah, the date, the date that he brought 350 cc's of Thorazine on? <laughs> You know, originally they wanted the part of Peter Venkman to be played by Bill Cosby. But in all fairness, we must do our best to reserve judgment on Ghostbusters 2016 until we see it. Yeah, it might be. It might be fine. I, 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 the only the only real problem is that there is almost zero percent chance it's going to be better than the original, sure. making the whole endeavor pointless. It's not pointless if they make a bunch of cash. And it's also not pointless if it makes me laugh the whole time. Okay. If it's a funny movie, I'm, I, I love Ghostbuster tech, I love the proton packs, I love the traps, I love the firehouse, I love Ghostbusters car, I love all that, that, that weird but somewhat realistic technology that exists in the Ghostbusters universe, and I love those three characters. Uh, I will be happy with this movie if it's just funny because I know that the technology in it is going to be over the top, it's going to be stupid, it's not going to feel believable because I've already seen scenes where they're like whoa, 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 playing around with stuff. I don't believe that Melissa McCarthy can make a proton pack. I believe that Egon Spangler could. But if the movie, if the movie is funny and not lowbrow and stupid, I will be okay with it. The, the neon library ghost spitting out the Nickelodeon slime is worrying. Oh, that, oh, there's so many worrying things. It's, it's not going to have that same tone where the monsters were serious. No. Everything's going to be wacky. Yeah. Well, I guess people, you know, when people criticize this new Ghostbusters film of not being serious, people often point at the first one as not being serious. And, and nobody ever fucking said it was. <laughs> Uh, but they, they, they point to some of the, the wackier elements in it, Slimer, uh, and the scene we haven't talked about, the, when Dan Aykroyd gets a blowjob from a ghost. When I was a kid, I didn't quite understand what was happening. Uh, I was like, Why, what's happening with his belt? And then it cuts to his face and he goes, oh, and then, you know, it's a thing for adults to laugh at. He doesn't... It's not like his pants fall down and then, you know, he starts having sex with her and then he farts. And then, you know, the ghost starts having sex with Egon. There is a joke about Egon of fucking slime in the second one, if you recall. Yeah, it's a holdover from when Harold Ramis and Ivan Reitman worked on Animal House. We've been going about this all wrong. This Mr. Stay Puft is okay. He's a sailor, he's in New York. We get this guy laid, we won't have any trouble. The the original film is like 90% witty, fun dialogue and interesting characters interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. It is, is it the most quotable movie of all time? It might be, it might be, yeah. There's so many, so many quotes and so many moments too that, that aren't necessarily quotable, but are just so good. Like uh, when they when they take the elevator, you know, and there's that old man like, <laughs> Yeah, see, you're laughing already. Just, well, just that scene, them taking the elevator. What are you guys supposed to be, cosmonauts? No, we're exterminators. Someone saw a roach up on 12 or whatever. Then they get in there and, you know, have you tested these? It's a, it's a, a nuclear accelerator. <laughs> we're wearing unlicensed nuclear accelerators on our back. Yeah. I regret that I have not tested these yet. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then S simpleness, he flips it on. Like that would make, like a, that difference. Would make a difference. <laughs> so subtle, so funny, so perfect. The movie still makes me laugh. I know. What the hell are you doing? 
Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. We thought you were someone else. There's an a, a line of ADR in the film, and Jay and I have gotten into arguments about this scene before, where he claims it's not ADR and it wasn't added after the fact. And let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Ray Stance says, Dickless over here shut down the power grid. Everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by Dickless here. And then the city says, that's not true, or whatever. And Bill Murray says, it's true, Your Honor. This man has no dick. Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. Mm -hmm. Then it cuts to another shot, and then you hear Bill Murray in the background go, well, that's what I heard. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. Well, that's what I heard. This city. Now, what do you think about that line? Do you think in post-production, Bill Murray said, that kind of sounds like I'm a homosexual. <laughs> How would I know if he has no dick? You gotta add in the line of me saying, well, that's what I heard. All right, all right, all right. All right. Well, that's what I heard. Because it really sounds like it's not part of the film and that it's an ADR line. What are your thoughts on this? I've never heard him talk about this line on anything. No, I've never heard anything about this either. It's just my personal theory that it was added later. That was not in the screenplay. <laughs> Well, how much of the movie was actually in the screenplay? I'm sure there was a lot of ad-libbing going on. So I, it could go either way. I just wanted to bring that up. It might not even have been ADR. It could have been, it could have been on the set he thought, oh no, they're going to think I'm gay, and then he just said it then. <laughs> I don't know. It just always stuck out to me, that line. And I always used to think as a kid, like, that sounds weird. Well, it doesn't sound like he's in the room. What does that mean? <laughs> and then... Um, <laughs> And then now as an adult, I'm like, it's true, Your Honor, this man has no dick. Then I'm just continuing on the scene. That sounds like the perfect comeback. And then it's, well, that's what I heard. And I'm like, oh. I don't know, Rich. I also never knew what uh, Ray yelled when they walked in, back into their, their science lab. He goes, hey, Dean Yeager. Possibilities are, are limitless. Hey, Dean Yeager. Uh, and I, I, I was like, what's a Hayden Jaeger? Because I didn't know what a dean was. I was well, too it's little. A, it's a college company, campus. There's partying going on. It's a, uh, yeah. some kind of drink. Right. Uh, but, uh, uh, he thought uh, they were going to go out like have a party. They were going to have a toga party when the dean showed up. Yeah. He needed to deliver the line, hey, Dean Jaeger. But instead he goes, hey, Dean Jaeger. Hey, Dean Jaeger. It's like part time. Like, the, uh, we need a different take on that. Ooh. Hayden Yeager! Hayden Yeager! Hayden Yeager? What? What does he say? Ah, whatever. He's, he's Dan Aykroyd. What do you expect? What does that mean? I don't, he's weird. I don't think we will ever have a formal relationship, a formal contact with any alien species out there, especially after 9-11, when we broke our toys in the sandbox. If they were observing that, goodbye human race. And uh, honestly, I don't think they're a mass threat, but I do believe they're breaking the law. I'm serious. Title 18, 1202. Uh, I, I, I think every little moment in Ghostbusters is somehow etched into my brain. Almost every little moment. And that's, that's when you know you have a really great film. Every it's one for the ages. It's one for the ages, and I can't wait to watch Melissa McCarthy fart ectoplasm. <laughs>